We got chip makers losing money. We got iPhones that are too hot to handle, but stocks right now are taking it in stride. We don't have big declines, but markets gotten dicey intraday. So we've got some time until the bell to get ready. Lizanne Saunders joins us this morning, Chief Investment Strategist at Schwab's Center for Financial Research. Morning, Lizanne. Morning, Oliver. How are you? Good and uh, preparing for inflation tomorrow. Let's talk about the trifecta of inflationary pressure. Yields, dollar, and crude, right? Yes. I, I, that, that's been the culprit behind the pullback uh, that started in the latter part of July. And all else equal, it puts downward pressure on more highly valued segments of the market. And in this case, the, the entire market is fairly overvalued. So it's not uh, surprising. And of course, we have to remember that the normal relationship between two of the trifecta, the dollar and oil, is typically inverse. And that's not been the case. So I think that adds to the kind of triple whammy nature of, uh, of those pressures. And uh, in the middle of down days for stocks, risk off sessions, we're able to find upside in crude, uh, and to your point, when the dollar is going up as well, and then bond sell offs in the middle of stock sell offs. That's to me what seems like uh, is reminiscent of last year in a not good way. Yeah, and you know we have to think back to October of last year. Uh, the the indexes at that point at the low had taken out their prior June low, which on the surface was a negative, but breadth was actually improving pretty notably under the surface, and that's you know in technical terms called the positive divergence, and that was a a really good setup. You started to see something similar in early June when you had had the outsized weight on performance up the cap spectrum into the magnificent seven the mega cap eight whatever you know category you want to look at and by june 1st it was not just that those stocks were dominating performance it was the remainder of stocks were so significantly underperforming over the prior couple of months you started to see a similar kind of convergence where you saw profit taking up the cap spectrum but you saw breadth improving down the cap spectrum that unfortunately gave way to an environment now where breadth somewhat across the board is weak. And it's probably the, the one thing that people point to when trying to gauge whether it was a true start of a new bull market is the lack of broad participation, not to mention the lack of participation by financials and no performance whatsoever from small caps. Normally they're ripping at this point, mm. you know, at the one year point in a rally. So, and I do like that point because the Russell is in this spot where it's been underperforming, but does that set it up for maybe better performance if the macro backdrop of the period since October changes uh, dramatically? Any thoughts on that, Lizanne? Yeah, so I think what you said after the word if is important because I think what has um, been a significant hit to small caps, especially Russell 2000, which doesn't have a profitability filter, is you've still got a fairly high share of zombie companies in there and the implications in terms of a 40 year record breaking upcycle and in interest rates by the Fed is such that, um, you know, covering interest on debt is getting much harder for many of these companies. And I think you need to be at that potential inflection point to not just a pause in policy, because a pause, assuming inflation continues to trend down, means higher real rates. That's not necessarily a positive, but we may need to actually have sort of within our sights the, the pivot to rate cuts. And that's not the message that the Fed is sending right now. They're emphasizing, as you and I have talked about pretty much every week for a while now, the four higher part of higher for, I mean, the four longer part of higher for longer. So I think you, you get some oversold pops and small caps. I think there might be some interesting opportunities. I think you just want to screen for for quality factors, profitability uh, factors, and don't just take an index level approach, especially to uh, an index like Russell 2000, which doesn't have that profitability filter. Okay, so the message of still being very articulate in our stock exposure uh, yeah. stands. At, at this point, when the breadth uh, starts to deteriorate, the number of companies making uh, yearly lows rises, we get the lower lows on the charts, lower highs. Is this a market that uh, it looks downtrending to you, Lizanne, or when should we really start to be concerned that, um, you know, the buying of dips and the trend has, uh, has shifted here? Because it was a long bull bounce that we got, or whatever we want to call it. <laughs> 
It was. And, and, you know, there's no question there's been a lot of breadth deterioration relative to the 50 day moving average. Um, no sector is above 50% of stocks trading above the 50 day moving average. So there may be more downside in terms of breadth weakness. That said, you do have indexes pretty much across the board that are oversold technically and and breadth is is mean reverting to some degree so even though very weak breadth is all else equal and negative for the market when you get to such an extreme you tend to start to move in the opposite direction i think a day like yesterday showed that there are dip buyers willing to step in and take advantage of some of these oversold conditions i just think it's premature to look at an intraday reversal like yesterday and the move up in small caps is the beginning of a of a new trend i still think we're we're likely to be in a choppy period near term. Mm. Okay, back to the Fed commentary, the higher for longer, the connection with bonds. How much of the stock analysis right now does come down to figuring out what's in the potential for bonds, Lizanne, because it does seem like some of our bond market has changed a little bit from a year ago. Even though a lot of these things do remind us of last year, these relationships we're talking about, the trifecta. There's a distinctly different thing happening now where uh, bond yields on the long end are rising so fast that the curve is actually expanding and you don't even have a very hawkish Fed, so we can't really blame them for that. So there are some different characteristics this time around, right? Uh, there, there's absolutely different characteristics. And I think behind the rise in yield are a lot of questions around, is it reflective of a move higher in, in our star? Is it about the, the burgeoning uh, deficit and cost of servicing our debt and the fact that mm. we continue to see less willingness to buy treasuries by foreign institutions, not to mention the fact that the Fed is no longer uh, the big buyer of treasuries and, and what kind of yield increase will be necessary to attract, you know, the private sector in the United uh, States. So we, we don't yet at this point know what the upside from a fundamental perspective, it would make sense that we're <laughs> probably there, maybe even beyond there. But uh, you've also got technicals that could kick in here and a lot of speculative money that doesn't just trade in the equity market can trade even in the treasury market. But it, there is a high correlation, um, or I should say an inverse correlation, but a meaningful one in terms of the 10 year treasury yield and corporate earnings. Um, the other factor that is, or metric that is highly correlated to earnings are, are PMIs. Mm -hmm. PMIs may have started to stabilize, but the, the yield piece of this, not to mention a stronger dollar all else equal puts downward pressure on S&P earnings, particularly those of companies that are multinational in nature. And I I think that's maybe particularly important right now since we're uh, a week or two from being in the third quarter earnings season where we'll get more color on just how significant the impact has been on on earnings. So the hope is that maybe if some of our uh, economic data shows up in earnings, the way the economic data has stabilized and impressed, hopefully maybe earnings can do the same. Maybe we can grow into our valuations, but that does seem like a pretty big ask uh, to your point when still there's not really like a resurgence necessarily in the economy. It's just about things being better and slowing down at a better pace than expected. That's not like a recipe for a big earnings revival necessarily. It, it isn't. And I think one of the you know important forces inside the GDP revision, you had the, the broader revisions, the, the multi-year revisions in terms of GDP and GDI, with GDP having been revised down, um, at least for the last four quarters or so, and it had been running much hotter relative to GDI, but also the second quarter GDP revision, where you saw consumer spending get cut by more than half relative to what the first print was of 1.7, not 1.7, but instead 0 0.8. And it was offset by better business spending. So I think that that's another potential shift to keep an eye on. It's 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 been my view longer term that we may be morphing into an economic environment that will be biased more toward the investment side of the economy and less toward the discretionary consumption side of the economy. That wasn't borne out in recent uh, data, but it may be getting reflected given the revisions that we have uh, just seen. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Uh, Lizanne, tomorrow, real fast, thought on what to look for in inflation, uh, what kind of tolerance the stock market might have for that number in terms of uh, an upside beat if one does arrive? 
I, I think there's probably very little tolerance for a significant move up in any of the inflation metrics. You know, we're, we're, we're likely to see the move up at the headline level because of energy, but I think it's the filter through to core and or how energy specifically filters into those core metrics that will be worth watching. But I got to think if it's an upside surprise, it's not good for the equity market, at least not short term. All right. Look, great stuff, Lizanne. Appreciate it. Uh, great commentary. Good to see you. Thank, Thank you. you. Taking us through the data from this morning, a little thought on GDP there as well. In addition to the big picture over the last couple of weeks, Lizanne Saunders, Chief Investment Strategist at Schwab's Center for Financial Research.